everybody. Welcome back to Find My Pass from Home. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Whether you're a returning viewer or whether you're new, please get comfy, sit back, relax. We're going to have a really, really good chat today about using the 1939 register for both house and local history. My name is Ellie. I'm Senior Community Executive for Find My Past. We should have Niall in the comments, so he will be sending out any links, answering questions, so please say hi to him. But I'm not alone today. I have Professor Deborah Sugrine with me of uh, the University of Portsmouth, because it's House History Month here at Find My Past, and we're all so used to researching people in our family tree, people that are connected to us. But what about the people who are connected to us via our homes? So this is why I've um, asked returning guest Deborah to join us today. And let's just add her to the stream so she can say hello. Hello, Deborah. Hello, lovely to be here again. Thank you so much for coming back. Um, Everybody at home, if you've not caught the last few appearances Deborah has had on Find My Past From Home, definitely go back and check those out. Well worth a watch. You can watch them on YouTube and in the video section of our Facebook page. Now, as I've already said, Deborah, you're 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 a design historian by trade, aren't you? And you uh, lecture at the University of Portsmouth, um, and you've got quite a got quite a varied uh, CV, so to speak. I mean, you contribute to TV, to radio, um, you contribute to House Through Time, which we all love, plus other TV shows um, like Inside the Factory, and also David Jason's A History of Great British Inventions. So. Yes, very, very varied career. Yeah, I mean, I, I am originally trained as an art historian and then I joined the Victorian Albert Museum as a curator. And that's where I made that kind of um, transition from art to design. And I had this amazing eureka moment because I, I um, catalogued some photo albums documenting the Ideal Home Exhibition a long time ago now, back in 1990. And I, I literally opened the box, took the first album out and just went, eureka, this is what I want to study because the Ideal Home Exhibition, longest continuously running exhibition in the world, I'm told it will be back. It was founded in 1908. You know, it's had to stop sadly. It would be on, I think, around this time now if circumstances were different but the, the brilliant thing about the exhibition is it gives a, a, an insight into ordinary people's homes and so I, I ended up leaving the VNA and doing a PhD about the ideal home exhibition and I've really been studying the home ever since. <laughs> it's incredible and are there any particular highlights of your career that you think our lovely community might like to know about at all? Um, yeah, well, I've done. I carried on doing a fair bit of curation. So, so I did. I did do um, a retrospective of the Ideal Home Exhibition a long time ago, actually, at the Design Museum while I was doing my PhD. I did that in 1993. But I've um, contributed to several other exhibitions. Most recently, an exhibition at the V&A called Food Bigger Than the Plate a couple of years ago. And at the moment, I'm writing a book on the history of the kitchen, which will tell the story of the development of the kitchen in, in the Western world from the mid 19th century to the present. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. And then um, my most recent publication, I will hold it up here, is, is this book here, which is about the interwar home, which has been my focus in in um, over several years. Um, this book actually inspired by a house built in 1934 that I owned that was like a time capsule. And that really kind of consolidated my interest in in that period so this this book um starts with the story of that house and delves into the the, the previous res, um residents of the house and there was only one family who'd ever lived in it that's why it was like a time capsule so I tell that story in the book and in my blog post for find my past on the, the 1939 register Fantastic. Yes, because um, you have written a couple of blog posts for us. Niall, uh, if you could just pop links to those in the comments for me, please. And also a link to Deborah's book, should anybody wish to purchase it, purchase. I don't know why I said purchase. Anyway, uh, let's welcome a couple of people in the comments. We've got lots of people joining us today. Uh, we've got Claire uh, saying some of my ancestors were born in Portsmouth and Claire joins us from Australia, one of our regular viewers. We've got Patricia, hello. We've got Daphne, 
lots of you here today. This is fantastic. Uh, I've got Karen saying um, she spent a large part of the day looking at Bastardy Records. They're really good, actually, really good record set. And yes, lots of you here. And William saying it's better weather in Cumbria today. Yes, same here in Edinburgh, actually. It's uh, brightened up something beautiful, which is really nice. Okay, if you do have any questions for Deborah about using resources for house history or design history, um, anything like that, please pop it into the comments and we'll try and get to as many as possible later on. Um, so what we're going to be talking about is using the 1939 register, which, as we all know, is a brilliant resource for family history, but using that slightly differently. So using it for house history and also for local history. However, if you're not very familiar with the 1939 register, we will do a quick whistle, -top, whistle, -stop, whistle stop tour of it as a resource now for you. So I'll pass to you on this, Deborah. What is the 1939 register? Is it, is it a census? Is it not a census? Well, it's, it's a bit like the census. In fact, it's a bit of a super census because it goes um, a bit beyond what we normally find in the census. So though when we get 1921, we are going to get some additional features in that. So it was taken um, when it was inevitable that war was going to break out and it was really intended to be used for kind of planning of around um, how to support the British population. There was a suggestion that they might introduce identity cards, which they never did, but if they had of some of the data um, from, from the, the register would have gone into there. So, so um, just like the census, it is arranged by address. And so the great thing about it for house history is you can search by address, which is which is really, really good. So if you don't know who lived in your house, that is a really good place to start. Um, I always recommend it as the starting point for house history, no matter how old the house. And the other thing I really love about it is it does mean it does mean you can research newer houses, you know, houses built up until 1939. So it fills that gap between 1911 and 1939, and 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 you know enables a, a history of 20th century houses. Um, the great thing on Find My Past as well is that there is a map search function and there are sometimes problems with the transcription of addresses. Sometimes the mistake is made by the person taking the register. Sometimes it's it's the transcription of um, the, the handwritten text into digital form, but you do have the opportunity to correct that. And that's when the map search function actually is really, really useful because, you know, it just, just in case there's a spelling mistake in the street that you're looking at, you can, you can go onto the map and find it that way. So, so that's sort of why I really love it as a starting point. You get a um, list of all the people who were resident in the house when the register is taken. And um, that that um, is great, but what it doesn't, you just have, there's a bit of a caveat there <laughs> that you have is. to be a little bit careful because it doesn't tell you who is normally ordinarily resident in that house. And one, interestingly, one of the things that I found in my research is people are quite often in this period, on the eve of the outbreak of war, visiting family members. Some people have already been evacuated. So women and children may have already gone. I have found it's really common for people to be visiting older parents, which if you think about it, that's what you'd sense. want to do, you know, and I think we've all got this insight through the pandemic into maybe what some of that felt like. And I think your first instincts might be war is going to break out. I want to go and see if my parents are OK. And in fact, when I followed up with the 1939 register from some of the case studies in my book, I found two examples of where I couldn't find them at their home address. So I, I searched for them by net, the residents by name because I already knew their names and found them staying with their parents. And in, in one case, you know, married couple each with their own parents. Some men 
are, have already been enlisted. So men are often away training as well. So you might find men in particular absent from the register. The other thing to be really aware of as well is that if somebody um, is um, under 100 or there isn't a death record for them, their name is redacted. So yeah. just be really, really aware of that when you're looking in the register. So, so those things are all incredibly useful. Gives people's um, year of birth gives their occupation, which is great. And the other thing that is really amazing is that if they are already signed up to some kind of um, war work, like for example, being an ARP fire warden, that is listed. So it gives you a real in insight into the, the, the kind of outbreak of war and the kinds of things that people were doing. And sometimes people have already changed professions as well and are being yeah. enlisted in, in war work. And then the other thing that is really amazing is that there is a column on the right hand side with annotations. And this is because the 1939 register was also used when the National Health Service was created. And it was used as the basis of um, records for the health service. And the really fantastic thing that is so extraordinarily useful is it often gives women's married names. This and is I've great, isn't it? Yeah, and I've had examples where people have, have subsequently married two or three times and you'll see the names crossed out. So it it's just such a, a brilliant source. But I think it, you know, for for house history, I mean, on a house history time, it's where we start. Start, if you want to do house history, start with the 1939 register and work backwards from yeah. there. The, the other thing as well, if you're really lucky, hopefully the street numbering will be the same. <laughs> but just be aware and certainly, you know, I'm 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 in, in in the ground floor of my house looking out the window. And like a lot, I live in in South Sea in Portsmouth, and it was it was bombed quite heavily as a a city, and in fact a, a bomb dropped on the end of my road. And um there so street numbering subsequently has changed. And um, buildings have changed. And the other thing you sometimes get is that houses that would have had a name subsequently have a number. And that is why the map function is so brilliant, because the map function on Find My Pass is also layered with older maps as well. So you that that can help you piece together. But it can be confusing when you're comparing the 1939 register with the 1911 census, because you need to be aware that what was number 20 in 1911 might not be number 20 in 1939. So just be be aware of that when you're looking. But there, there this is where, where maps are incredibly useful. Absolutely. And I think I really love the map function that we've got and just the way you described it as having these different layers. It's really easy to explore a mod your modern day street, your modern day area with, you know, uh, the, the next layer I think is from about the 1930s, 1939. And then the next layer is about the 1880s. So that's really easy to navigate. But what I love is doing that and then combining it with the NRS maps and going even further back. I really yeah. enjoy doing that. And, and the other thing as well that's lovely with the map view is that you may be just interested in one particular house in the street, but it enables you, it will bring up, link to the map, all the houses in the street. And so you can have a jolly good look at who else lives there. So, so something... I, I, I've been doing a bit of um, street history where I live live now, um, very typical um, 1870s terraced house. And one of the things that has been really, really fascinating, and I'm only just dipping a toe in the water, I'm hoping this will become to get my <laughs> WhatsApp group that we set up in, at the beginning of the first lockdown interested in this. But one of the things that's really interesting is when you start comparing the residents in the 1911 census to the 1939 register, 
you can see that the street is really changing, that people, that whereas um, in the earlier censuses, quite a lot of people had servants, they were very much in professions, you can start seeing houses of multiple occupation and people in much more kind of manual occupations, but it's quite mixed. My own house is really interesting because um, the, the the woman who lived it in 1939 was born in the house in the 1870s and lived in it from when it was built. And even though she had three brothers, she inherited it. And I also discovered through house history work, we're, we're lucky, luckily the, the rates books, which are another really, really good house history source have been digitized for Portsmouth. They haven't all, all over the country, but I discovered that she, it says living on her own means, but she owned another house in the street and that she was obviously collecting the rent from that. And that was giving her an income. So, so you know, 1939 is a starting point, but it allows you to work backwards from that, but also forwards as well, which is, I think, an, another really nice point as well, especially, you know, we're, we are living at the moment in the period where um, it's the anniversary of the Second World War. In fact, my local archives and museums in Portsmouth have been doing a really amazing thing. They have been live tweeting the Portsmouth Blitz. So oh every, goodness. oh, it's absolutely fantastic. So the, the the it was the anniversary of the bomb that dropped on my street a couple of weeks ago. And they've been using um, the um, fire warden records and the bomb map and, and, putting them out on the Twitter account through through the D-Day Museum and Portsmouth City Museum. And, and bomb maps are, you know, brilliant sources as well. So, you know, using, you and again, you know, my dream, my, if, I, if I wanted one set of house history records digitized at the moment, I'd like to see the bomb maps from all over the country digitized. It would be absolutely fantastic. There is a, there is a brilliant pro project, um, the link to it is in my blog post where the London bomb maps have been digitized actually by colleagues of mine at the University of Portsmouth quite a long time ago now. And so if you're interested in house history in London and you, you're, you know a house has been bombed or you suspect bomb damage, that's a good place to look as well. So there are, you know, there are ways of going backwards and forwards. And then the, the other, I think, really important source for going both backwards and forwards is delving into local newspapers via the British newspaper archive. If you've got that in your subscription or you subscribe separately, because once you start uncovering some clues to the house, you can start typing in the the um, address of the house into that and all sorts of things come up. It's, so especially good if you're interested in World War II history, you'll get those f accounts of, of the bombs fall falling in your street. Something I mentioned on Friday's Live a, a couple of weeks ago was the fact that I've, I've recently moved to Edinburgh and I decided to try and um, search for this building in the newspapers. And I have dozens of references and I've written them all down by hand because apparently I'm, yeah, <laughs> didn't do them digital. Um, but yeah, the newspapers are incredible for cross-referencing. Um, before we move on, I do have a quick question from Matt, if that's okay. And it just comes back to the 1939 register. And he said, can you explain why the 1939 UK register is public when the censuses, as in 1921 onwards, aren't? I know, the, I know those who are on it are still alive, are redacted, but this isn't done for other references. I don't know why the decision was made to make it public and, and digitise it. I'm incredibly grateful and I wish it had been <laughs> done much earlier. Um, I suspect, was it done for the, the anniversary of the outbreak of the Second World War? As far as I'm aware, it's because it's not technically a census, so it doesn't oh. fall into the Census Act. Oh, um, so this is why they've been able this is why it was able to be digitized. Uh, ahead of the 100 year rule. Oh, but, that's really interesting. But that's why I think that was the caveat. You, you, we could digitize it, but we then had to redact anybody under 100 years old or yeah. still still alive. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I, di I didn't see, I've learned something today. I didn't know that. I mean, I, you know, my, my frustration is it, um, 
it it wasn't live when I wrote the first edition of my book <laughs> and you know I was able I was able to pick up on it a bit in the second edition but I would have made much more use of it but you know certainly it you know I mean the excitement about getting the 1921 census to fill that gap between the two is just amazing you know I I, I can't wait <laughs> absolutely um, yeah, another thing to mention about that as well is that because because of the nature of the register, we, we're going to be opening more and more records as sadly more people pass away and more people more people become over 100 years old. So more will be opened as time passes. And it is important to note that Find My Past has the most up to date version of the 1939 register. Just wanted to get that one in there. OK, have, have we missed anything in terms of why it's such an incredible resource for both family history and house history? We've talked about a lot of things already. Yeah. Um, just trying to think if there's anything we've missed. Um, I, th I think I mean, I, I think the other thing is is just, you know, to really emphasize that idea that you can delve into it by location. And the other thing, actually, I should say, which I always say is, always go to the manuscript don't just rely on the transcription yeah. because sometimes there are mistakes in the transcription and so and you know sometimes handwriting is really hard to read and sometimes it's the original transcriber's fault or sometimes it's when it's being digitized and you have the capacity to correct that which i was really enjoy doing the corrections <laughs> because <laughs> because sometimes that's based on a bit of personal knowledge you know where an e is read as a c or something like that and someone is missing so you can you can make and submit that correction but always 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 go go to the original image don't rely on the transcription top tip and and you know sometimes um if you really really cannot find the house you're looking for through a map or and the map search doesn't work and this can be particularly problematic when you're looking at villages hmm, where no there are just house names and, and not street names and in fact I've got exp personal experience of this because my mum lives in a converted vestry in Devon um, and we weren't sure what, because she didn't get any any deeds with her house. So we were, the deeds seemed to have been destroyed. We weren't sure when it, the conversion was made and what it was called in 1939. I could not find it via searching for it or on the map function. And in the end, I had to go by the parish and search that way. And it turns out that there is just the most bizarre, I don't know which way the person taking the register walked around the village, <laughs> but, it, and, and the way it's been presented is it muddles up her village, which is misspelled with the neighboring village. So it hops from house and it's a li literally a little tiny hamlet of less than 10 houses. And so it really, really took some, you know, a bit of detective work to find her house in that. So sometimes what you just have to do is go to the manuscript and really search through. And it can be, it can be a challenge, um, especially with buildings that have been converted or, mm -hmm. or buildings that are not, where there are no street names, which is very common in villages, and um, where there are no house numbers or things have changed. So you may just have to very patiently work your way through the manuscript to find the building you're looking for. I think that's a really valid point. And something else to mention before we move on is that the 1939 register was organised slightly differently to a traditional census. Um, so instead of having your addresses listed by street, town, county, country, it was listed by street, district, county. Yeah. So this is why sometimes, you know, you struggle to find if it's especially, as we've said, if it's a more rural area, you struggle to find a particular village because you're not sure which district that village fell into and things like that. So my advice then, I think, would be to to not be too exact in your search. Um maybe just try the name of the street plus the county. Um, but then also bear in mind that, you know, county boundaries changed a bit. Yeah. I mean, I found my mum's house by finding the neighbouring village. 
when I just gave up and it was it was so incredibly misspelt it just bore no well and in fact and it was very confusing about which the 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 person who took the register seemed to be very confused about where the boundaries were Mm. and maybe they've changed as well you know that's that's the other thing is that things do change um so it was just a slog, but a very, a very enjoyable one if you'd like that sort of thing, which of course I do. So. <laughs> I think we're in good company. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so lovely. Now I'm just going to have a quick flick through the comments. We've got lots of questions coming, which is great. Um, and we're going to do those a little bit later on. Uh, I'll just read out some of these comments before we move on. So Claire says, the 1939 register is one of my favorite resources for my maternal side of the family. I wish there was the equivalent for Ireland. lovely okay and question from katie did they do a 1939 register in scotland um i don't know the answer to that to that one do you you i presume you do vaguely yeah so it's it's not quite it's not quite as similar as the one for england and wales but any data for 1939 is still held uh, by the national records for scotland if anybody wants to check those out but, but presumably that's not available digitally I at the moment. So. No, no, somebody no. wanted to correct me in the comments, but um, as far as I'm aware, I don't think it is available digitally. Yeah, I mean, my understanding has always been there isn't a similar register for Scotland, and, you know, that's very disappointing. Yeah, it's a shame. Okay, so what we're going to do now, everybody, um, Deborah has kindly... Um, and I've also done this as well, but we've done some case studies. So first we're gonna look at how we've used 1939 register for house history, and then we're gonna do local history after that. So um, Deborah, if I share your slides, would you like to kick us off for your case study? Yeah, so so this um, is is one of the stories that appears in my book. I should explain that my book is in two editions and um, I published a revised edition last year. And when I wrote the first edition, the 1939 register hadn't been, been digitized. And so my publisher gave me the opportunity to write a new introduction um, on how to do house history. And I included in that a bit of an update of the the data that I'd found. And I just thought it it might be of interest to tell you about one of the stories um, from from the book. So um, one of the stories, um, so that's the first edition. Um, So here's, here's one of the stories is based on the mass observation archives and I don't know if anyone any of you have used mass observation really really interesting um, project that was set up during the war where they recruited people to record their daily experiences mass observation still exists still exists so it was it was it was founded in 1937 and so it's a kind of ethnographic anthropological endeavor and they had people that wrote diaries called day reports and they also would issue directives and I found this particular diary because one of the directives they issued was about what do you have on your mantelpiece and because my book is about the history of the interwar home this is just the most brilliant report and interestingly mass observation have revisited this several times and some of you may have have, um been aware in the last year that the the Jeffrey Museum about to reopen as the Museum of the Home have also revisited the mantelpieces project and and did an exhibition I think at Burnley Museum based on photographs of what people keep on on mantelpieces so I came across um, there are a lot of diaries in the archive you can access mass observation online via public libraries or you could buy a subscription fairly hefty and my university spends a lot of money on it or you can actually visit the the um, archive as well in person in Brighton and so um, there was there was one person who took place in the mantelpiece survey who was the only person who submitted a photograph 
of their mantelpiece. Quite a few people did drawings and they were asked to record what was on their mantelpiece, but also to visit kind of friends and neighbors as well. And I thought, oh, I want to find out a bit more about her. And I started reading her diary and her diary is just fantastic. And it just kind of gave this bit of color to the story of the interwar home that I hadn't really been able to find anywhere else. You can see here, I have redacted her name because although you can see the name in the, in the records, you are not allowed to publish names. Okay. Because people took part in mass observation on the basis of anonymity if things were published. However, you can see the names in the digitized records, but when you when you publish for a mass observation, you're taught to redact names. So the lady I wrote about was a 38 year old housewife living in Marlow in Buckinghamshire. So she was a full time housewife um, and you can see here she says we live in a small new semi-detached house five rooms and a bathroom with a good garden and um, she goes on she goes on here and describes a bit about the house she was married and she had an 11 year old daughter and the reason that this diary gripped me is because it becomes really apparent that she hated housework and so a lot of the sources, if you're trying to reconstruct the history of the home, you often go to domestic advice manuals and women's magazines, which are very much about the idealized version mm. of and here here was this this kind of story of the the kind of very laborious housework. So this is a um frustratingly, just like I said, her house was known by a name. There are now numbers in this street. So I've never been able to identify the actual house. But this is this is our house from the street. It's the kind of house that she would have lived in. And there was a big house building boom in the interwar years where um, nearly two million houses were built for private sale. And lots of people became homeowners for the last for the first time. And home ownership in the interwar period went up from about 10% to nearly 30%. It's really the period in history where the British be begin to become a nation of owner occupiers. There is also as well a, a big um, building boom in um, social housing. Um, and um, if you're really interested in that, I recommend hugely the Municipal Dreams um, blog run by John Bowton. Amazing, amazing. And about a million council houses were built between the wars. So this is this is the house that she lived in. And here is the, the photograph she sent in of her mantelpiece. And what is so brilliant is she says, enclosed is a snap of the sitting room mantelpiece. Although a family secret, I think I should mention that the flowers are always arranged so as to hide a crack in the mirror, <laughs> which is just brilliant. That's why they're off center. Absolutely fantastic. This is a woman after my own heart, I swear. But, but it also, because for me, it becomes a kind of metaphor for her home life because the other thing that you find from reading her diary Diary, is that she is from a very working class background. She was from a, a large family. Her father, um, who she, she doesn't like at all, is very negative about. And she's also quite disparaging of her, her family, especially one of her sister-in-laws, who, who she keeps saying is very common. <laughs> and, um, and it becomes really apparent reading the diary that her husband was from a much more middle class background. So she had married into the middle classes. However, they are in far more straitened circumstances than they were um, before the First World War. And this is what's really interesting, that her, her husband trained as an engineer, but he's working as a bus driver. So he's really come down in the world. And one of the things she talks a lot about in the diary is his very snobby family coming, coming to visit and how difficult she finds that. And at one point she says, I feel like the maid of all work and hostess combined because she doesn't have servants, whereas her husband was brought up with servants and some of her family, his family have servants. And so she feels, you know, she really feels that she's being judged. High so expectations. I had, yeah, yeah, hugely. So I, I had that to work on and I had the diary to work on. And then amazingly, when I found her in the 1939 register, a whole load of other things 
opened up that really allowed uh, have allowed me to flesh this story out. So, so in the 1939 register, really interestingly, her husband's no longer employed as a bus driver. He's working, doing war work, erecting metal aircraft frames. So I think this is really interesting because he's returning to his former occupation in engineering. And I was thinking, well, that's really interesting. That might have been quite good for her. And I've also been able to dig into the family background of them both, particularly this thing about snobbery, which, which so I discovered that her father was a bricklayer. And that, you know, so, so you can imagine someone from a very smart background who was trained as an engineer, he went to boarding school. And, you know, he's really married um, someone of a lo lower um, status. I discovered that her, her father-in-law was an accountant. And she also talks about the fact that her husband had a very distinguished record, war record in the First World War. He was mentioned in dispatches. And then I was able to uh, find his war records and find my past as well. So, so the 1939 register really opened things up. I also discovered that she'd been active in the WAFs in the First World War. And I wondered if that's how they met you know, because because that's I think a really interesting thing is what what was behind this mixed class marriage because that's still um, relatively unusual. The other thing that is really interesting as well is that now if I go on to the next, yeah. So oh, so I popped this in here um, just before I move on. This this is this is from a household advice manual published by the Daily Express. So I popped this in here as an example of how how tedious her day is. And her day really is a bit like this with all the, you know, this amazing amount of of cleaning that she, there's a brilliant account of washing day where you really feel for her because she keeps hanging her washing out on the line. It keeps raining and she keeps having to bring it back in again. But it's a yeah. small servantless house. I know, I know the expectations and the standards. And um, remember this is done without domestic appliances, domestic appliances, you know, although there were things like washing machines available, if she was lucky, she'd have an electric iron. But but they weren't widespread at this point. Um, so this is the record in the 1939 register for the family. So you you can see her um, her husband there um, of erector of metal aircraft frames. She's doing unpaid domestic duties. There's an enclosed record, which is the daughter. There's another name underneath. And this is really interesting. And I, I have to say, I didn't pick up on this until I went back to the register yesterday. So this bit isn't in my book. Because, but what is at the end of her diary for mass observation is, uh, is, is um, she says, I've been contacted by the council and I've been told I should be prepared to take a... Ref uh, a um, a um someone who has been um evacuated into the home and there's huge anxieties about having an evacuee and she has real anxieties that because although she complains about her husband's family being snobbish it's also clear that she's a bit of a snob and what she's really worried about is is having someone a bit rowdy and and particularly in the diary her husband works a lot of shifts as a bus driver doing very early mornings and she doesn't want someone who'll who'll disturb him and we can see this other name here which I think is really interesting at the bottom of the 1939 register because it looks to me this is a 13 year old girl like she has taken in an evacuee what I haven't had a chance to do is to find out is this a family member or a, or a stranger but I think Next that's really in interesting research. yeah yeah another another bit so that you know so that is opening up a really interesting story a house history story about what's it like to have a stranger come and live in your house which was a really common experience or conversely what's it like for this little girl where did she come from what was it like for her and you know we we know there are amazing stories about children from cities being evacuated to the countryside and encountering things completely outside of their experience so there are you know there are some 
So, so, so just this one entry in the 1939 register suddenly opens up a whole set of possibilities, which I think are really interesting. I'm going to be honest, I've never heard about mass observation before. And when I read it in your slides, when you sent them over, I thought it was to do with Catholic mass. No, no, it's an amazing. <laughs> and, and because there are some really, really good books that the people involved with the Mass Observation Archive have produced that I really, really recommend. And some of you may have seen the dramatization with Victoria Wood of one of the, oh, yeah. the diaries. Yes, I've heard of that. Yeah, Housewife. I can't remember what the number is because the Mass Observers all have a number so this this one is number 82 and so that there have been some good kind of anthologies that have collected together their stories so if you're wanting to kind of flesh out uh, some family history from the period from the wartime period the mass observation books are really really fantastic resources and it's some of you Sorry, Deborah. Go on. Yeah, I was going to say some of you may even have family members who kept diaries for mass observation. That might be in your own family history. I'm definitely going to go and have a look at that. It's something that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago on a, another farm I passed from home was um, the importance of family diaries and things like that. And we spoke about whether we should actually, you know, take up journaling again with the year that we've all had. And actually, I'm pleased to report I have taken up journaling again, everybody. Well, and, and you can volunteer for mass observation because it's still a live project. And so they have a day every year where they ask people to submit their their day report. And of course, you know, this the, the day, I think, I can't remember if it's passed this year or not, but what an amazing snapshot of the pandemic, you know, because our our daily routines for lots of us have been disrupted you know I've been yeah. working from home for a year now I've only set foot in my university office twice to go and collect books you know which all had to be arranged in advance and so you know it will get so so in a way mass observation you know as well as giving us this incredible snapshot of wartime is going to give us another one of life in the in the pandemic anyway that's that's the end of my my slides oh i was just going to say there anymore yeah. but um yeah that's, that's just incredible and obviously the way you can sort of pick bits from and find bits from different sources to build up that bigger picture i just I just think there's something really magical about it right i have some slides to share um so what I've done is had a quick look at a case study for house history. And what I decided to look at was, um, it was a farm that was near to my, where my grandparents lived when I was growing up. And this farm I just thought was, um, it's just got quite a, quite an interesting history. And you know, there've been bits of information that have trickled down to me from people like my grandmother and my mother and you know, the distant cousins, et cetera. Um, but in any case, what I, what I really wanted to highlight is the different ways I went about trying to find this farm. And because you can search the 1939 register by person, address, or the map search, there's three different ways that you can find what you're looking for. So if you're after a particular address, as we've already said, you can search by address, and you just go onto the 1939 register, and instead of having it on the person toggle, you put it onto the address toggle, and you can have a look there. Um, you can also search by map. So with the maps, you can actually put in to search by street. Uh, you can put, you, you can even put in the name of your town. You can search by postcode and you can also search by coordinates as well. Just wanted to mention that. And then you might see the bottom left hand corner where I've circled in yellow. Those are the layers of the maps. So the one that is showing us at the moment is the, the modern day map and you can change it there. You can change it back to the 1930s and then also the 1880s. Um, so yeah, if you search by address, what I was the one I was looking for was a, it's a, it's a Welsh street, it's called Ford Penhrilfa. I probably pronounced that wrong. Um, but um, yeah, it's quite difficult to find because sometimes it's as, it's, it's as the Welsh or it's as the English. So what I did was I just searched by the beginning of the street name, if it was going to be in English, so Penhrilfa Road, 
got my very Welsh accent coming out there. Um, you can also add in a borough or district, but I didn't know what borough or district this was going to fall into because it's in a, in a small village. Um, so I left that out. And as you can see, uh, I've got the got the result there. It's Penhrilfa Road in Prostatin Urban District in Flintshire. It's not in Flintshire anymore, which is just everything moves. So then when I open up those addresses, I've got a list of results there. And the one that I'm after is in the middle, which is Melid Farm. And I can choose to either look at the transcription or the image. And I like looking at transcription first, but I always go back and check the image. So I've brought both of them up here. And what is interesting about Melid Farm, and the reason I looked, wanted to look at it is not, not only because it was close to where my grandparents used to live when I was growing up, but also because my great grandfather's eldest sister, Elizabeth, actually married into the family who owned this farm. So we've got a bit of a connection there. And the, the, that family had actually lived there for decades. And I was reliably informed that at one point, this farm was the village post office. So quite an important hub for the village of Melodon. So I find Elizabeth and her husband, Harold, living in the 1939 register. And I can see there that Harold is listed as a dairy farmer and a pig breeder. So that tells me that at this point in the house's history, it was listed as a farm. It's no longer the post office. So that is a really good, um, it's a good point for me on its timeline. And as we've already said, the 1939 register is such a great place for a starting point for your house history. And um, so now that I knew that, I could then go on into other censuses. I could go into newspapers, etc. cetera. Um, the one thing I did want to point out as well is when I was looking up Melid Farm, I actually found my grandparents' home that they lived in for, I think, about 30, 40 years. And I spent a lot, lot of time there as a child, Lo lovely views over um, the northwest coastline and things like that, fantastic gardens. And I hadn't found it before the other day when I looked, looked at Melid Farm again. And it was because I looked at the original image for Melid Farm and then I found my grandparents' old house. And that told me that in 1939, my grandparents' house was a boarding house, and I never knew that before. And it fit with what I know about the existing house that was built, I think, just over 100 years ago. And it's, it's two properties in one that are sort of connected by a door at the top of the stairs. And my great grandmother used to live in the, the adjoining house. It was a little bit smaller. So that fit in with what I knew. So what I imagine is that the two people who were living there at the time, the um, I think there was somebody who ran the boarding house and then his wife, they must have lived in the smaller part of the house and then they let out the rooms in the bigger part of the house. Um, and then when I went back into the earlier censuses, that then told me that A, it was listed as the post office. Not sorry, I'm talking about Melid Farnap. Talking about this house. Um, but yeah, it was back in the earlier censuses it, was, it wasn't a boarding house and there were fewer people living in there. So I, na I know at that point, say 1911 going backwards, it wasn't two properties then. And apparently it was built on the site of a much older house that was actually, I think, sort of a, a one-story cottage, I think. I need to do a bit more digging. But yeah, I just think that's, there's, so much, there's so much to discover. And I just, just by looking at one record, um, and then what we thought we would do quickly as well, I also prepped a, a local history example um, in case anybody is curious. So we've talked we talked about house history, but you can also use the 1939 register for local history too. So I'll just fire through these slides as well, because I do want to make sure we've got time for questions. Um, so yeah, the, the, the area I looked up was actually my childhood street. Um, so what I did was I did an address search, I opened up the original image, and then using the page navigation tool at the bottom, I could then explore who was living on this street, which is a big long street, one of the main streets into Rill in North Wales. And I can see the, the variation of people who are living here. Um, I can see that some, some of the house names have a bit of a Scottish flair, so another's named Kia Ora, for example. Um, and we've got people who are like, you know, they're, they're woodcutters, they're postmen, they're nurses, um, they're drapers. One was an ex-ship captain. And as we've spoke about before, I can spot a lot of women living alone 
and some of these houses are really big like I'm familiar with the houses along this along this street um and I just wonder I wonder if it comes back to what we said before with you know a lot of the men already leaving if that makes or, sense. or there are a lot of widows from the first yeah. you know from the first world war and a lot of women never married like the woman yes. that lived in the house I, I live in at the moment um and so that so there are you know the, the women women lost their husbands lots of women there was a shortage of men to go around yeah. because of the the casualties amongst young men so so spinsters were common and it's really common as well to find households of siblings living together as well um and and you know the other the other thing of course is same sex relationships as well which is another bit of research i've i've been doing um where i've i've been tracing a same sex relationship through through house history and and discovered um that this couple lived together for over 40 years but of course they're very hidden in in the kind of archival records because you know you you how how do you prove that it that it was a a relationship and not just a friendship so there are there are other kinds of households and i think you know i think that's really common but you you certainly do i mean just in when i've done my street um I think there are, it's not a very long street, there are less than 30 houses. And just from memory, there are at least three or four households of sisters living together, of adult sisters living together, who who are either spinsters or widows. So that's, you know, that that's, re and, and remember, women tend to live longer than men as well. So, yeah. so, you know, that's really common. Yeah, I think that's a really valid point is to not I don't know what's happened there, bear with. I think that's a really valid point is that, you know, don't just assume that every household will have a traditional um, family living there, you know? It, it doesn't quite work that way. <laughs> Um, and, and the, but the I think the register will tell you whether people are boarding, won't it? I'm trying to remember if it does that. No, um, I, I think that's I think that's earlier census. That's earlier, isn't it? Because yeah. that's the other thing is that people often take in lodgers on a very. Yeah, I don't think the 1939 register tells you. You're no, right. It's really people frustrating. <laughs> take it, take in lodgers. I mean, this is this is as well. You know, it's also, you know, worth remembering that lots of people, of course, are renting. That's why rate books from earlier period are really, are really good as well. And supplementing with the electoral registers and, direct, you know, the directories are increasingly being digitised. You know, they see, more seem to come on board every time I, I look, but they can be incredibly useful and and um trade directories as well can can be really really useful yeah anything that's going to help build, build up that bigger picture and adding clues is a winner and um, just to finish up as well and um, what's really quite good about the 1939 register is if you go onto one of the transcriptions and you scroll down you actually get some contextual information um it's it's quite simple but what we can see here for real we know that um, 56 percent of the people listed on it were actually female so that that supports what you were saying a moment ago Deborah we've got things like popular occupations we've got an age breakdown and um, we've also got things like popular surnames as well so yeah lots of detail there um, I'm just going to remove my slides now there we go um, are you up for some questions Yes, yeah, that'd okay. be great. Let me have a flick through and see what I can find because everybody has been chatting in the comments already. Uh, Matt actually saying, I'd never thought of using the 1939 register this way. Yeah, it's just, it's just brilliant, isn't it? Um, okay, I'm just having a flick through for questions. Um, bear with me two seconds, everybody. I'm just seeing what I can find. Yeah, just Valerie saying, where do you find the mass observation records, please? Yeah, so so mass observation online has been digitised. If you're, um, I mean, if you can get to the British Library, you can access it there. Some local libraries, um, um, the, your kind of big public libraries may have decided to have a subscription to it. Um, 
I think you can do, you can take out a paid subscription yourself. It's an Adam Matthew database. Um, the other thing, as I said, you can do is visit in person in, in Brighton. So it's a, a, um, the Sussex Archives called The Keep. It's, it's part of those. Interestingly, I have been using it for many, many years. And knowing the archive as a paper archive, I remember having some correspondence with them when it was digitized because there were records that I couldn't find through the digitization and um, to do with the indexing that I knew were there. And, you know, uh, sometimes there's just, there's something very nice about holding the paper in your hand and, you know, um, seeing that yourse yourself. But, um, yeah, it, 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 it has been digitised. Um, libraries, when they subscribe to it, subscribe to different levels of it. So there are not just um, the diaries, the day reports. They also issue what they call directives on different things. And then they used the directives to publish books and they publish quite a lot. So there's a brilliant book, which is fantastic if you're interested in this period for house history, called An Inquiry into People's Homes, that they based um, questionnaires that they, they sent their ma mass observers. And the thing that's really fantastic about it, it was published just after the war, I think in 1946, really easy to, I think, it's still in print. You can pick up a secondhand copy. And the thing that's brilliant about it is it it's about people's sort of hopes and desires. So it not only records how people lived, it also records what they want after the war and post-war reconstruction. So it's been a fantastic um, um, thing for my, my work on the kitchen. Really, really interesting. And there are, they looked into pubs, they looked into sport, they they looked into eating out, all sorts of smoking. So there are all sorts of reports, and quite a lot of them were were published as as penguin books. So you know, there's quite a quite a lot you you can um you can you can get from the secondary sources that have drawn on them. There there've also been there was a really, um, gosh, what she called historian at Sussex University. Did a, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but did a really brilliant book about the kind of history of love and romance based yeah. on the diaries. So that because they're such good sources for those insights into people's, you know, not just facts, but also their feelings and their, you know, their hopes and aspirations. So they're a fantastic source. Yeah, and I think sometimes that 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 sort of evidence so to speak is something we don't necessarily consider in family history house history but important nonetheless right let's see if we can squeeze in a couple of others so paul has asked the address for my great grandfather in stockport is missing <laughs> do you have any advice well it's a bit like what i said be before that that you um using the map so using the map search so i'm not i'm not quite sure what the question means does it mean you know the address and you can't find it in the register am i am... yeah i think that's what he means yeah, yeah. So it should be like he, it should be there and it's not i mean I well but probably like it has been mistranscribed by either the person who took the register or when it was digitized so the the thing to do is if you know the name of a neighboring street you can do that through the map. If you can find that street in the register, then go to the manuscript version. This is how I found my mum's house and trawl backwards and forwards through it. And you usually get a sense of which way, you know, the person yeah. had walked up and down the street because it varies, doesn't it? And hopefully you'll find it that way with a, with a bit of detective work. Um, but yeah, the, the, you know, and then of course, when you found it, and if you find there's a mistake, correct it because you'll benefit other people. What I like to do is if I'm hunting for an address in the register that is a bit trickier to find, and I am having to go through the, the original image, the manuscript, I usually have the, my search up on one screen and I have a modern day map up on another screen, like Google Maps or something like that just to give me get my bearings of 
where I think the next page, the next book might go, if that makes sense. Oh, and, the, well that, and that reminds me of another thing, because you saw my screenshot was from Google Street View. I use Google Street View all the it's time so for good, house it? history. It's so good. And I often use the, you know, we're just beginning to, w- to work on the new series of A House Through Time. And I haven't seen the house yet. So what I've been doing is walking up and down the street on Google Street View to ha- to get a feel for the area. The other source I really love as well for house history, which is um, may not seem apparent at first, but I use estate agents' websites a lot, particularly Zoopla and Your Move, which have archived um, for sale details. And they often go back 10, 15 years now. And if I can find an unmodernized house for sale, then it can give me a really good idea of what the interior, you know, that because it will have a, um, if I want to think about what the inside of the house looks like, you know, I'll have a look for interior features. So the, the, ha- the new house we're using for the new series of House Through Time doesn't have a huge amount left in terms of surviving original features, but one of the neighbouring houses I discovered does. And I had a good look at the estate agent's details and you'll get floor plans as well, which are really useful. So they're they're a great source and planning records as well. Local authority planning records, because the other, you know, houses don't stay the same, they change. So and planning records, um, I mean, the, the the Oxford ones I used in my book when I wrote about the house that I lived in, you know, I was able to trace, date the kitchen extension through to the 40s through, through the planning records, which had been digitized. So they can be really useful. And if you're lucky, you even have things like architect's drawings as, as well. And, you know, or even if it's just a builder doing something very rough, it can give you an idea of how, how a house changed. So sorry, I digress but, no um, not, not at all useful I mean, as I'd thought of that one as usual um you know the hour runs away with us but um you know we've we've not done many questions we've not talked about you know house through time either so what I might do is I might pick out one of the question and then we'll we'll maybe wrap up with maybe chatting very briefly about house through time yeah sure very briefly I know you can't say much anyway <laughs> um so yeah let's pick out one last question um Actually, there's one here I can answer. Uh, Brian asking, when will the 1939 register be updated? Over the next few weeks, keep an eye out on your Find My Past Friday emails. There are some new ones coming. Fantastic. Um, Okay, right, let me just have a flick down, see if there's any more questions here about house history. Um, Actually, I think, Let's take this one from Bev, actually, as the last one. Good morning from New Zealand. I've been trying to find my grandparents' house history, but when I look at the 1939 register, it only shows three houses on the street. Would there be any reason why all the houses would not have been included? It might be because because the address has changed. So you are looking for an address that maybe it was called something different then. And so that that could be a reason and that's often you know that's that's one of the problems we always have with house through time <laughs> is I remember I can't remember which series it was but at one point we went down a complete blind alley and realized we were researching the wrong house so um, you know it that, that it, it happens that they 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 change um so that's the only reason I can think of or there's been some kind of a misunderstanding around, you know, what street the house is on, you know, like I explained earlier. Of course, yeah. I mean, this is a this is a period as well, you know, where there have been four million houses built between the wars. It, so streets, you know, things had changed very, very fast, and and things did change their names you know that that whole streets could change their names so so that it might be something to do with with that so again broadening your search and I think doing a bit of detective work might might help you get to the the right place hopefully lovely well before we go then what can you I appreciate it might not be a lot but what can you tell us about a house through time um, well, we are only, as I say, I haven't even seen the house in person yet. I think I do my first bit of filming in early May, but it's not actually going to be in the house because we've been very 
delayed as you can imagine um with with the various lockdowns so we are in Leeds and so we are in a very different city to the ones we've been in before because if you think of the, the where we've been before we we have um, been in Liverpool Newcastle and Bristol we've had that kind of port city thing going mm. on quite quite a lot and what Yorkshire has is the textile industry and when we were looking for a house I remember saying to our series producer whatever house we find I bet you anything there will be several stories with links to the textile trade because it's so important in Britain in the 19th century so so and we haven't had textile industry before so that is you know that that and there are other industries going on in in Leeds too but textiles is a a big one so you know that so mills but think of the other processes associated with textiles I think as well you know one one of the things we've talked about as a as a team is I think the experiences of the last year are going to make us hyper alert to stories we always get about death from disease because we've you know we've through living through this terrible pandemic we've got this kind of very different insight in into um what our ancestors might have experienced the other thing i think is really interesting is um we're in a period now where the uses of our homes have really changed lots of us have been working from home and of course historically people often did work from home it was you know so i think i think we may when we see the series I think, you know, if you think of the series was broadcast, um, I think it's almost exactly um, a year ago, we we went, we went, the last series went out. Um, and, you know, say we're only in the early stages of making this one. I'm told it will be broadcast before the end of the year, we hope, but we do, we never have a day until the last minute. The BBC keeps us on tenterhooks <laughs> and then they often change their minds as well. But I think... We may view stories differently through the lens of what we've experienced in the last year. I, I think we will, you know, we will bring that to us as viewers and maybe stories will take on a different kind of significance to, to what they've taken on bef before. So I think, you know, they're, they're sort of things we're, we're sort of teasing teasing you know we are still working on stories because obviously we don't cover everything that happens in the house and we you know we do go through dead ends and things and you know where we where we or we'll have a story that we we can't find a way of bringing it to life or we can't find enough information or sometimes things have to go I mean it's amazing what ends up being cut we film far more than we mm. than we um we use so um so that's something. And then the, the other thing without giving too much away <laughs> is we are in early stages of talking about some additional way of covering some of the stories in the programme outside of the programme. Excellent. So there's... Good to hear. So House Your Time may be appearing on some other media somehow. And then the other thing I ought to give a plug for is House History Hour. If you're on Twitter... Yes. House History Hour every Thursday at seven o'clock. Myself and um, I think there are seven of us, seven house historians, inclu including Melanie Back Hansen, who's also a friend of Find My Past, who works, who ha who who particularly um, does some of the house history research for House Through Time. I have a broader historical consultant role, but also particularly bringing the interior to life. Um, 
we all get together for an hour on Twitter at seven o'clock using hashtag house history hour. And we usually have a theme every week. We often have a special guest. We had amazing John Bowson, who does the Municipal Dreams blog, talking about social housing last week. Our special guest tonight is um, from Historic Houses, which is the umbrella organisation that looks after all the independently owned historic houses open to the public. Because oh, okay. one of the things we've really been wanting to do through the pandemic is to support the heritage sector when they're having a really difficult time. So, you know, one of the most brilliant guests we had was we we, we had um, the manager of Dr. Jenner's house, the home of vaccination, who was just amazing. And we do, we have a website now and we do also publish um, the highlights of every week every week's tweets as Twitter moments and once a month or so we do an open session where you can join in and ask ask us our house your house history questions we'll particularly help try and help you if you've hit a brick wall <laughs> and fit, fit, well literally metaphorically <laughs> we'll, we'll try and help you with that but we've you know we've we've had all sorts of and um, increasingly we we have lots of guest ha- hosts so we did a, a wallpaper special recently as well which was fantastic with Zoe Hendon from the Moda archive so and we we've got various special guests coming up so do join in if you'd like we'd love to see you on on Twitter it's brilliant so yeah a couple of things there everybody if you've not watched A House Through Time yet, I would really advise going to watch it. If you live in the UK, I'm pretty sure you can catch up on all of them on, on the BBC iPlayer. Um, and yeah, House History Hour every Thursday over on Twitter. So I think that brings us nicely to an end. Um, thank you so much to everybody who's tuned in today. Thank you for all of your fantastic questions and comments. Apologies if I didn't get to your question. Um, as you can see, Deborah and I, you know, we can just chat for hours. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's been a brilliant, brilliant hour and a bit. Um, Before we go, just to let you know, everybody, Nico's going to be back for Friday's Live tomorrow. Um, And next week, we've got Paul back for more um, on the British Army. And then we've also got a very special something lined up for Anzac Day. Uh, That's going to be broadcast on Thursday, so a week today. And I think all that's left for me to say is, Deborah, thank you so much. Um, You're not very only, welcome. Not only for, you know, giving up your time to come and chat to me and chat to all of us about house history and your expertise. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just, just, just wonderful. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, then, everybody. So have a fantastic rest of the day. And as I said, don't forget to tune back in for Friday's Live tomorrow, which will be a lot of fun as well. So take care, everybody. Thank you so much. And thank you, Deborah. Bye-bye.